This is the Lena Philipson Award, who commemorates the second EMBL uh, Director General. It was launched in 2014 by Emblem, who is, which they are the, the commercial subsidiary of EMBL, thanks to uh, Gabor Lam. And now, since then, it has been, um, you know, supported by Emblem. It is given by outstanding contributions in translational research and technology development in the life sciences. And up to now, there have been eight winners. Do we have the slide? one of them a Nobel Prize. And this year, the prize goes to Des Higgins for his design and democratization of methods uh, for multiple sequence alignment. And he will be introduced uh, by Janet Thornton here, uh, former EBI director. So welcome, Janet. I think so. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm not quite sure I can follow the previous performance here. <laughs> a little bit of a big task to, to do that. Um, but I think our uh, winner of the Leonard Philipson Prize equally deserves the accolade. So um, I'm Janet Thornton, I'm a computational biologist, and I've known Des Higgins for many, many years. I have to say, I am also probably the most recent Emerald alumni, having retired last Friday. So, <laughs> so I'm here as a real alumni, um, but it, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Des. I won't say terribly much about him, because he's going to tell us about his career himself. And he said, no, don't say that. And don't say that. I'm going to say that. So just to highlight one of his real uh, achievements, I think, has been to be part not only of Emil Heidelberg, but also to be part of Emil EBI, because he was one of the first people who were employed at the new then called Outstation <laughs> um, in Hinkston in the UK. And so he's been part of these two communities that work together. And I think, um, of course, he didn't stay at Emble. He went on to Dublin, uh, well, via Cork actually in Ireland, back to his native island, um, and has been a professor at the University of Dublin, but he also is now a retiree, and I understand enjoying it very much. <laughs> uh, so this is all a recommendation for the future. But Des's, Des's real claim to fame has been his development of this uh, program, Clustal, that probably many of you in the audience will have used for your own work. And it's was actually written when Des, the first, the first version was written when Des was a mere PhD student, or was it postdoc? Yeah, a postdoc. And then he came to Embo here in Heidelberg as part of the data library. And this, of course, the multiple sequence alignments, they capture the evolution of proteins. They are really probably one of the best ways, apart from, of course, perhaps in three dimensions where you might want to capture the evolution of protein, but in the linear sequences. And Des created this program, which allowed us, when, when I first started, and I'm sure Des was the same, oh no, he's a bit younger than I am, but we had this book with all these uh, pick a pink book from Margaret Dayhoff with the sequences written out. And when you were aligning, I can remember aligning things by hand, and the only way to do it was to write them out and shift them and color, color them in pens. Des realized, working in an evolution lab, really, and phylogeny lab, that the importance of these multiple sequence alignments, which really today is still underpin. I think, our understanding of evolution. But Des not only saw that this was a good thing to do, 
but he has really spent a lot of his career working with his colleagues, um, especially Toby, I would mention, and also Julia, I think, um, on developing future versions of Clustal to the extent that these papers are, were recognized by nature as being in the top 10 most published scientific papers ever. I mean, this is some achievement, to say the least. And it speaks to this translation, but it's translation in every sense of the word. We know translation become, can be used for translation into industry or translation into medicine or into agriculture. But essentially, because this evolution underlies everything that we understand about, um, about proteins and how they work, it really is the ultimate in a translational product because it's translated to so many people worldwide. And of course, Dad has also always made it open and colleagues, you all made it openly available and relatively easy to use, <laughs> not always. <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was good to do that. So um, I think, you know, I can't think of a better tool this software tool to receive this award from Leonard Philipson um, because, because it is so widely used and so widely appreciated. But of course, um, and in fact, in total, it, I, I looked on Google Scholar, 212,000 citations in total for Des's work and almost 100,000, I think, for just for, well, depending on which clustal paper you take, enormous numbers of citations. I mean, way more. So I think your total number of citations was two, is 212,000 at the moment. I mean, that's a lot of people saying, oh, this work is, I've used it and it's been important to me. And I think that's a real, to, to Des's credit. But not only that, everybody who knows Des just loves him because he's, he's just such a nice, good, generous, friendly, fun person. And he's really been, I think, at the heart of, phylogeny can be quite dry to some people, but it never is with this. It's always fun to do. And so, as was said in the previous award, you know, I really cannot think of a better person, and it gives me great pleasure to be here and um, offering this award to Des. Couldn't be a better person. Thank you, Jennifer. I did this, oh, <laughs> Before I give my talk, I did this. Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Oh wow! Happiness. No one with the. He says uh, happiness. With the audience in the back. Thank you. It's very hard to give a talk after that. Uh, um, I'd like to thank Emblem. Sorry, the, there was a clicker. This will do. I'll, it's okay. I have a I have a cursor. I'd like to thank. Uh, sorry. Well, I want to thank you, Janet. Uh, you're a hero, a mentor, a friend. Thank you very much for all that. Um, I want to thank the uh, board of the Alumni Association, um, thank Emblem, uh, thank Emble. Uh, it's been a hell of a ride. I did retire last uh, <laughs> last September, uh, but this is, I thought last September, was, I'd, I'd give my last ever seminar. This is my fourth seminar this year. Um, but I, these are fun, this isn't really a seminar, this is reminiscing. I want to tell you about me and Clustal uh, the date here, 1988, the first version of Clustal I wrote was 1988 in Dublin. 
And I put down 2022 as the end date because that's when I retired, although Clustel still exists out there somewhere. Um, I started off in life as a biologist, uh, did an undergraduate degree in botany, plants are great. Um, I hated biochemistry and microbiology and cell biology. I loathed it. Um, uh, this, this would come back to ha haunt me later on when I had to teach by my first lecturing position, I was a lecturer in a biochemistry department. So I now know quite a bit of biochemistry and actually biochemistry is great stuff. Um, it's, actually, it's actually quite interesting. Um, uh, uh, but anyway, I started off as a field biologist. I collected spiders and bumblebees. I got four spiders new to Ireland. Um, I did a PhD in the zoology department. And it turns out um, as part of this, by accident, I had to do some computing and I discovered computing and I adored it. Um, this ability to walk up to a computer and type in a load of code and get pictures, get stuff like this out. It turns out I'm autistic. Um, and uh, biology is really messy, uncomfortable stuff sometimes. Um, biochemistry actually isn't so bad, uh, but field biology and taxonomy can be really messy. And, and it's very hard. it can sometimes be difficult to put things into neat pigeonholes. And I thought this was miraculous. You could take some plants or insects, measure stuff on them, record some features, put them into a computer program, and you get these. You get these amazingly linear, organized looking diagrams. And this was my way of, of trying to organize biology. And so this was done without DNA sequences. It turns out the code I used to do the clustering that you can see in that, uh, that was using a thing called UPGMA, it's a clustering algorithm. Some of the code for that went into Clustal and is possibly still in, it, it's still in there somewhere. Clustal Omega, we took an off the shelf high throughput clustering thing, so it's gone now. Uh, but I know that clustering code in, in Clustal was so popular because it was kind of neat. I was very proud of that. It, it, that came from my PhD. Um, but a lot of people have stolen that clustal code. So clustal has been stolen in different ways over the years, but the clustering bit has been stolen out um, and I don't care anymore. Um, the, uh, when I say stolen, stolen means people took the code without referring to you. If, if they refer to you, that's not stealing. You're welcome to do that. Anyway, um, in 1985, I had two lucky breaks in my life. Lucky break number one was in 1985, I got a, position as a postdoc, my first ever postdoc position uh, in Dublin with a guy called Paul Sharp, who's now a professor of genetics in Edinburgh University. Um, he's only a couple of years older than me. I was his first postdoc. Um, it was my first postdoc. And um, this was the Irish National Centre for Bioinformatics in 1988. And ironically, when I retired last September, two of those guys, Dennis Shields and Ken Wolfe, were in the offices next door to me in a different university. It's just we followed each other around, but Ken and Dennis were PhD students. Um, uh, I was actually the National Centre for Bioinformatics. I had a job to get or write bioinformatics software um, and make it available to users in Ireland, people who had DNA sequences or protein sequences and who wanted to analyze them. And uh, in 1986, I went to my first ever conference uh, this was a, a bioinformatics, they didn't even call it bioinformatics. Bioinformatics wasn't totally widely accepted uh, in use as a term. Uh, this is in Waterville Valley in New Hampshire in the United States. Uh, this is 1986, and half of the world's bioinformaticists at that time were at this conference. There were 200 people. And uh, so it was a small, geeky collection, but a collection of self-important people. We reckoned we were onto something, that this stuff was going to be important. And it was going to be hard to ignore. And little did we know just how much this would happen. But it's an amazing conference. I met Gene Myers, some of you know, Lippmann and Pearson, Smith and Waterman. I met all kinds of amazing people. Um, Masatoshi Nei, senior author of The Neighbour Joining Method, he gave a talk. Um, but most importantly for me, I met this man. This is Graham Cameron. And this is my second lucky break, ending up coming to EMBL Heidelberg. I'll, I'll, think, I can't my next, I'll tell you about that in a minute. There's more stuff from Dublin first. Anyway, um, Graham Cameron was uh, head of a thing called the Data Library, which essentially was a, a, a place where there was a, a database of DNA and later protein sequences 
um, which were being collected. And the reason it was one of these in EMBL Heidelberg was because a man called Michael Ash. It's not, it's not good timing. Um, <clears throat> so it was a man called Michael Ashburner came to EMBL in 1980 and persuaded EMBL that they should set up a database. And he died yesterday. So, uh, um, this isn't good time. Um, Michael wrote me uh, the ref, the, the current job, the job I just retired from in September. He wrote me the reference. And uh, I'll get back to Michael first. Michael was also an associate director of the EBI, of the, um, and he was head of research there uh, when I went there. Uh, but I'll get back to Michael again shortly. Um, back in Dublin, um, I had to, uh, PCs were in their infancy in those days. I'll get back to PCs in a moment, but we had to do most of my computing on a mainframe computer. And mainframe computers were basically enormous boxes with almost no memory. This big box would have had something like two megabytes of memory or maybe four or five. Julie can probably remember, you know, something like this, a few, meg maybe, maybe five megabytes of memory. And uh, this was the university mainframe and it was almost impossible to use. I managed to set the databases up on it. I set up similarity search software. So we had access to the databases. And uh, I, at the time, the ICL was so bad that Paul even took this photograph and said, this is me battling the ICL. And, but for day-to-day -day analysis in the lab, everyone rebelled. They said they weren't going to use the ICL anymore. So I had to, because I had to maintain the databases. I'd get the databases by half-inch tape from Heidelberg. Um, uh, half-inch tapes, these are things like reel-to-reel -reel tapes, if you've seen them in Mission Impossible films or something like that, or maybe uh, James Bond from the 60s, you know, those big sort of quick wheels that spin around. And uh, once every three months, these would be posted out from Heidelberg, from um, uh, the Bay, under, somewhere near where your office was. Um, somewhere on, on, so is that the, that's the first floor just over the upper one. These are packaged up and, and sent out all over the world. Uh, but we decided to try and do as much day-to-day -day analysis as we could on PCs. And back in those days, the first PCs had 640K of memory. So that's slightly more than half a megabyte. So there are 1,000 megabytes in a gigabyte. So it was almost no memory. And a quarter of that was taken up just to run the computer. So you had about 500K of memory to play with to do everything. Um, and uh, it, was, it was also come, they had small hard disks. So you would, every time you finished a project, you'd work on, a, on one of these PCs for an hour. You then deleted everything you did to make room for the next person. Um, and, but I did, I had a very good Pascal compiler, I think called Turbo Pascal. I later got a C compiler, but I didn't know C very well at the time, as Julie knows very well. But that's, that's another story for beer maybe. Um, but I did have a very good Fortran compiler. And so this is what I ended up wrote, writing most of my software for, for the PC. Ironically, this thing called Microsoft Fortran for MS-DOS, which is a bizarre mixed metaphor. And anyway, so I wrote all kinds of software. To this. I, I had the databases on the mainframe. This is in the days before everyone was on the internet, as before Blast. So I wrote my own similarity search software for the mainframe. Um, it was... Uh, it was using something called the Wilbur and Lippmann algorithm. It's kind of precursor to FASTA. So back in the Stone Age. So we had the databases, we had similarity search, um, and we could align two sequences. We could do dot plots and so on on the PCs. But a common task, a common thing that, that we were faced with um, was how to make these, as Janet explained. And we needed them for phylogeny, uh, protein function people wanted these for just to, to to look for the bits that were conserved right you might be able to identify active sites if you look at these globins if you take any one of these globins and ask why is there a v here or an n there it's very hard to tell when you just have one sequence unless you do a lot of experiments but by lining up a diversion set of globins you get some clues you can see there are only seven exactly conserved residues and two of those are the heme binding histidines and these days, if you make big enough alignments, it helps you solve uh, protein structures uh, computationally. We needed them for, uh, uh, for phylogeny, as Janet explained. 
And we initially, when I, the first one I made, I used with pieces of paper and colored pens and a scissors. So you cut out your sequences and you, you, you'd use a scissors to insert a gap. And this was doable, but it was very soul destroying because it could take ages. This alignment here could take, I don't know, would take a few hours or whatever. whatever. It was also subjective. Um, so you're wondering, well, should I put this histidine with this histidine or that one? And, or, and so um, rather make, get a computer to make arbitrary decisions than do it yourself, because at least then you don't have to worry, agonize over it anymore. So in the late 1980s, there were various methods knocking around for doing this, but it's before everyone was on the internet. And in fact, it turns out the first proper sensible method for doing this went back to David Sankoff in 1974. But a lot of people had forgotten about this. That was kind of rediscovered or reinvented in the late 80s. And I knew about these methods. It was one by Willie Taylor, a mutual friend of ours. It was one by Jeff Barton. Um, uh, the, uh, Russ Doolittle had a method, but I figured out how to do this on a PC. So I figured out how to do this in 500K of memory, where if you can see in the abstract, you could align 100 sequences of 1,200 residues and do it quickly on a PC. And when I say quickly, it might take five minutes to align 100. Well, 100 sequences of 1,200 residues, that might take half an hour. But this computer had almost no power and almost no memory. And so I, that, that was how Clustal started. This was Clustal 4, 1989. The only reason I show you that is because I don't I couldn't find Clustal 3, which came before that. And Clustal 1 and 2, you don't want to know what they did. <laughs> and that's, that's just something else. Um, and I then, um, uh, so we published that in the, in the late 80s. We had to distribute these on things called floppy disks. So uh, I'm looking around the room, I see the people who are nodding. I can tell your age. And <laughs> so, so there, there, there are things. So the hard floppy disks weren't floppy, they're about that size. They were the modern ones, they were high capacity. They could hold a megabyte. The ones before that were about, well, they're five and a quarter inch. So they're about this size and they're in little sleeves and they were floppy, exactly. <laughs> and uh, so for people to get the software, they had to write to me sending a floppy disk and I would send them back. And so I, I got letters from all over the world. I got some amazing cosmonaut stamps from um, Dimitri Frischman, who sent me a floppy disk from Russia, which didn't work. And, but I gave him another one back and said, anyway, we said we distributed this on, on, on floppy disk at the time. And then I came to Emble, and then we could distribute it on something called the EMBL file server. It was a, an, an email server where you could send an email message, something like get software colon plustal and send that to something like netserve at emdl-heidelberg.de and you'd get back an, an email message with a lot of hieroglyphics so that was a, an encoded form of, of the software and so i can remember when we released Clustal v in 1992 overnight 400 copies had gone out so that was twice as much as in the previous four years all the other copies of Clustal 4 and so then uh, it gets on to the highlight of the peak of peak Clustal where um, first of all, I met Toby. So when, when did you arrive in Heidelberg, Julie? Yeah. You, okay, so before I met you, I met this man, Toby Gibson, who's sitting there. And so, uh, uh, God, we've hardly changed at all. No, so, so I, don't have any, I, don't have, I don't have any old photographs of Toby um, it's before digital cameras. So this is obviously a relatively recent photograph. And uh, Emble was a great place for meeting people. Uh, it was a very open place. You could just wander into any beer session you liked or any coffee session and get talking to people. And I got talking to Toby and Toby said he was making multiple alignments um, and he was doing this by hand or I got it out of him. He didn't, maybe he didn't want to admit it. And, and I, I said, I've got a, a program for doing that. And, and, and he said, yes, but it won't be as good as how I can do it by hand. And I said, oh, uh, don't be ridiculous. Whatever you think you're doing by hand, it, it, it can't be that good. And Toby then, so again, this is the most recent photograph I have. So Julie and Toby are sitting there uh, just a few rows up. And so this is uh, Julie in the background who uh, started off Life and Emble um, as a, prog a programmer. Um, was that your official title, programmer? Was that your official staff level? Anyway. So Toby, it turned out, had all these brilliant ideas as to how you should make multiple alignments, some of which were sensible. Uh, okay, okay, is that a fair comment? And uh, but some of them were some of them, some of them were complicated, 
And guess who had to implement all of them? So that was Julie. <laughs> and some of these were easy to implement and some were not. Some were nightmarishly difficult. So uh, Julie did almost all of the programming. I did bits and bobs, we did bits and pieces and you took my Crystal V version. Um, uh, but uh, all, almost all the programming was, was done by Julie and we produced this. And uh, the author order, I wrote the manuscript. I didn't trust Toby to write it. So, <laughs> and I, I, now I tell you, um, I started writing this when I was in Heidelberg. I finished writing it uh, in Hingston. I'll get back to that in a moment. Julie went first author because she did all of the hard stuff. Um, I decided to put, I, I wrote, I put Toby last. You assumed I would go last because it was, because I, Clustal was originally mine. I put you last and we had a, a chat about it. And I said, no, 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 you, you, go, you go last. It was your staff member who did, who did all this. Was it, and this was done as, it was an open collaboration. We did the authorship at the time. If I'd known that this was going to be the 10th most cited paper of all time, <laughs> I mightn't have been so hasty, but it was a, it was, it was, it was a, it was a collaboration, okay? Um, and basically, so I just, there are about 20 things in here. So Toby's ideas as to how you should do multiple lines. So one of them, for example, these are scores for um, how likely you are to see a gap beside an amino acid. And they're based on counting gaps beside amino acids in supposedly known alignments of, of structures. And so if you normalize around histidine, then you're more likely to see a gap around glycine with a score of 0 0.61 than around um, methionine which has a score of 1.29. And so and I, I, that kind, in some ways that just, it all, you could also say gaps are more likely to occur beside glycines because they do, uh, and beside hydrophilic residues because they tend to be in loops. But that's kind of hand waving. So this turned it into scores. This is all very easy to describe. You have to turn all, you have to normalize all of these and turn them into actual code combined with all of the other rules that Toby came out with as well. And so it, when you, Effectively, the aim was to have position specific gap penalties, where when you were taking a piece of alignment and trying to align it with something else, you would make it more likely to have a gap in a position where there were already gaps and within several amino acids of that gap, and more likely to have um, gaps in hydrophilic positions or some underlined hydro hydrophilic residues here, and so on and so forth. Um, and this was the alignment that Toby got out of this. These are SH3 domains which were, is an, a, a favorite alignment of Toby's because it's actually very nasty to do. And um, it's tough to do manually and it's very hard to do automatically. There was always a fear that basically Clustal was a piece of software designed around making as alignments of SH3 domains and all of the other alignments could basically follow. And nobody's, Toby's looking at me half nervously because it's half, that's half true, but it gave, it gave this beautiful alignment. It also gave this amazing color scheme. So Toby, you're colorblind. Toby was very keen on his colors and color printers were becoming possible these days as were color terminals. And um, in the meantime, get back to colors shortly. I moved to, the, um, to what used to be called the outstation. So it's now the EMBL EBI. Um, it it's started in this hut as a prefab while the real EBI, the, the first EBI proper building was being built. This is Peter Storr, sadly no longer with us, removing the sign of the old prefamp, possibly to, for his children to put it on eBay 20 years later. I don't, <laughs> as historical, a historical document. Um, I was in this, uh, in the top right office here. I was the only researcher in the building, apart from Michael Ashburner, who was a researcher. But his job in the EBI wasn't at that stage to do research, it was to direct research and to get research started um, at the EBI. And uh, so if you go back to this paper, by the time we submitted it, my address was the then, as we called it, it wasn't the EMBL EBI, it was the European Bioinformatics Institute in Hingston Hall. So as far as I can tell, as far as I can guess, this has to be the first research paper from the EBI. And it's possibly the first ever paper from the EBI. There's a good chance. If, if it isn't, it doesn't matter. No one will know. And so, uh, so of that, I'm very proud. And I'm very proud. All of this work was a classic EMBL collaboration between friends. We met over coffee. It was a gentleman's agreement that, that this should all be done as a, for the common good and because it was an interesting thing to do. And of all of this, I'm very proud. Um, 
by the time cluster X came out, this is um, this came later. So this came 1997. I was back in Ireland in University College Cork, and this involved a lot of color. So basically, Julie was tasked with, or Julie decided. I don't know whose idea it was first. It was an obvious thing to do. So, so whichever of you thought of it is to make um, a Windows version, so something that you could click with a mouse and it would have menus and, 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 and so on. And uh, so you used X Windows for the first version. And so there's this wonderful um, clickable interactive uh, program. And this is the program that most people got to know, certainly most undergraduates in undergraduate courses. When people were being taught by informatics, they got to know Clusel X and Clusel X was also full of another set, a brand new set of Toby's brilliant ideas, some of which were sensible. Uh, and so, uh, many of which have got, gone into this about how to highlight badly aligned regions, how to highlight regions of, of an alignment in columns or in rows that you would like to look at again. And uh, so then, um, yeah, I knew in, by 2010, I knew that the Clustal W paper was the 10th most cited paper of all time, according to the usual citation sources. I told my boss, and my boss immediately started phoning the Irish Times and the journalists. What, 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 what time? Is it? Yeah, okay, this is the last slide. Um, uh, but there was no website showing this. So I, I, like, it was just something I knew because Stephen Altshul, a friend of mine, was counting citations. But it, um, this finally was published in 2015, this list, and the Clusel W paper was number 10, and the Clusel X paper was number 29 of all time. Now that, I am proud. I think we should be proud. So thank you, folks. Thank you very much.